Kwe Kwe, bonjour, good morning, and to those in Japan, konbawa. My name is Scott Simon. I am researcher at the Center for International Policy Studies, or SIPS for short, chair of Taiwan Studies, as well as professor and assistant director of the School of Sociological and Anthropological Studies. I am very pleased to welcome virtually to SIPS his ambassador, uh, Yama Nouchi Kanji, Members of the Japanese Embassy are distinguished speakers, as well as colleagues and viewers from Canada, Japan, and around the world. Je suis très heureuse de vous accueillir tous à l'Université d'Ottawa, Yokoso. Cet événement est organisé conjointement par le Réseau d'études asiatiques de CEPI, le CHER, C.N. Paul M. Tellier en affaires et politiques publiques de l'Université d'Ottawa et l'Ambassade du Japon. Economic security is a very timely subject. Canadians should be very concerned about issues of economic security and supply chain resilience. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, we were even unable to secure enough masks and other PPE for our frontline workers and population. Now our auto manufacturers are struggling to obtain the semiconductor chips needed to manufacture cars. There will be other problems down the road, especially if some countries weaponize supply chains to coerce other countries to do their will. Just this past June 10th, just five days ago, Prime Minister Kishida Fumio gave the keynote speech at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore. In his Kishida Vision for Peace, he promised to promote five pillars of initiatives, one of which is economic security. This was already an important theme in Canada-Japan relations. When Prime Minister Justin Trudeau welcomed the election of Prime Minister Kishida last October, he specifically said that close relations with Japan, based on strong historical bonds, common values, and vibrant people-to-people -people ties in multilateral and bilateral contexts, and in the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership greatly contribute to our economic security. Both sides are committed to deepening the relationship between our two countries. That is the spirit that animates our event today. Our guests today have long and distinguished CVs, which makes it difficult to properly introduce them, especially because we have to leave time for a webinar. Ambassador Yama Nouchi has been in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs since 1984, and in, after many important postings, including in the United States, he has been to, he's been ambassador to Canada since March, 2022. Mr. Oda uh, Yasuhiko is a Tokyo based columnist and TV news commentator for Nikkei covering foreign affairs, international trade, geopolitics in the Asia Pacific region and various global issues. Ms. Lynn McDonald is director general international economic policy at global affairs since September, 2021. And professor Patrick Leblanc is Associate Professor, Public and International Affairs, and CN Paul M. Tellier Chair on Business and Public Policy, University of Ottawa. Today, we will begin with opening remarks by Ambassador Yamanouchi. Uh, Mr. Oda will give a presentation on economic security. There'll be a panel discussion uh, with, uh, with General Director McDonald and Professor LeBlond, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience and I will remind the audience members that there's the Q&A button to use for that rather than the discussion button. So thank you all for being here. And I will uh, begin by showing some remarks from, from the ambassador. Good morning and bonjour to the audience from Canada. Konbanwa to the audience from Japan. Jumapel Yamanochi Kanji. My name is Yamanochi Kanji. Ambassador of Japan to Canada one month has passed since my arrival to Canada in May. Today, I'm glad the Embassy of Japan is holding this webinar on economic security with the Center for International Policy Studies and C.N. Paul M. Teller Chair on Business and Public Policy at the University of Ottawa. I would like to thank the keynote speaker, Mr. Yoshihiko Ota, Ota-san, a senior writer at the Nikkei newspaper, and I'm grateful to Professor Scott Simon and Professor Patrick LeBond of the University of Ottawa, as well as Ms. Lyne, McDonald, 
Director General of International Economic Policy at the Global Affairs Canada for their cooperation to make this webinar possible. Mesdames de Monsieur, today the world is facing more diversified threat than ever before. Urgent responses need to be taken to address the new reality. One of such threats is the expansion of security risks in the economic domain. In other words, economic security. The COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's aggression against Ukraine have made clear that the global supply chain cannot be taken for granted. Even a little shock to the supply chain could make logistical operations unstable and vulnerable. The disruption in the supply of critical and core goods could cause surges in their international market prices and even lead to security risks. We recently witnessed such cases with supplies of personal protective equipment, PPE, at the early stage of the pandemic. And, we, and also, we see there are serious challenges in energy and food supply stemming from the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. The supply of semiconductors also became a problem due to lower rates of factory operations caused by the pandemic. Cutting-edge technologies such as semiconductors, AI, and quantum computing are critical technologies that bring economic prosperity more than ever. But at the same time, we should not forget that the, these high-tech could also pose security risks if they are used for military purposes. Now we know there are countries that do not. Now we know there are countries that do not hesitate to put pressure on other countries by taking advantage of their economic of their economic dependence. This kind of fact implies that these risks are not necessarily transitory. Given such changes in the security environment to today, Japan recognizes economic security as a new and a critical challenge for its national security. Therefore, we give high priority to responding them. Prime Minister Kishida has been putting his effort into establishing the strategic autonomy of Japan's economic structure and achieving technological superiority. For example, Prime Minister Kishida created a new ministerial position for economic security at the inauguration of his cabinet in October last year. Moreover, the Economic Security Promotion Bill was enacted in the national diet. This new legislation aims at supply chain resilience, essential infrastructure protection, technology development, and the protection of patent applications. In order to effectively address such economic security challenges, it is critical to work together among allies and other like-minded countries. As a matter of fact, Japan has had various discussions with Canada and other G7 countries, as well as European and Southeast Asian countries. Mesdames de Messieurs, Au Medellani, le Japon et le Canada ont pacté le point de vue sur la coopération dans ces domaines prioritaires qui contribuent aux régions Indo-Pacifique, Libel et Uber. Ils incluent notre coopération et mature d'énergie et de la promotion du libre-échange et la mise en œuvre des accords connexieux, y compris la résilience, la chaîne d'approvisionnement. Nous avons poursuivi notre discussion sur la coopération spécifique dans ce domaine. We have continued our discussion about specific cooperation in those areas. Ladies and gentlemen, in the summit meeting in this February, Prime Minister Kishida and Prime Minister Trudeau also agreed to cooperate in the areas of energy and natural resources. With the Ukraine crisis, 
Air Energy Canada, the largest pro private investment project in the history of Canada, has become far more important for energy security in Japan and in the Pacific region. As you know, in Air Energy Canada, where Japan, a Japanese companies, namely Mitsubishi, has played a significant role. Today, we will be listening to a discussion between Mr. Oda and the Canadian experts on economic security, both in the government and in academia. Mr. Oda is an expert in, ge in geopolitics of critical technologies, including semiconductors. I hope that today's webinar will invigorate economic security discussion between Canada and Japan. And also, I expect today's webinar to give insightful, in, insightful implications for our future cooperation. Canada-Japan cooperation will not only bring about prosperity and stability of our own two nations, but also contribute to betterment of the Indo-Pacific region and the world based on a free and open international order. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci pour votre attention. ご清聴ありがとうございました。So thank you very much to the ambassador. ありがとうございました。Um, now we can move on to the、uh, presentation by、uh, Mr. Ota. And so Mr. Ota, you can go ahead and begin sharing your slide. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Simon.、Uh, my name is Yasu Ota. I'm,、uh, good morning, everybody. I'm, this is the evening right here.、Uh, I made a slide, so I'm going to show it.、Uh, but the, the topic today we're、uh, handling is quite broad, isn't it? I think,、uh, you know, economic security, but I just want to focus on the、uh, technological side,、uh, digital economy.、Uh, let me share. The slide I made. We're going to talk about the digital economy. And、uh, okay, I believe the, there are two pillars、uh, of the, the digital economy. One is、uh, virtual, the other one is real. I mean,、uh, the invisible data or and a semiconductor, which is hardware. Uh, data flows you know,、uh, over all over the world, and somebody has to catch it.、Uh, some hardware has to catch and、uh, proceed the, the signals in it. So that's semiconductor. So I just uh, uh, want to focus on、uh, semiconductor supply chain and the data.、Uh, for example, Amazon,、uh, because of the, the, the COVID 19 crisis, We stay home and spend more time at home. So, I don't think I can, we can survive without Amazon. But is Amazon the only superpower in the data economy? No, not really.、Uh, look at this map. Amazon is dominant power in North America and Japan and India. It's the orange one. But look at China. It's a blue one. It's Alibaba.、Uh, there's mo so many、uh, e commerce platforms in the world. So, we should not assume that Amazon is the only one.、Um, I was in Singapore.、Uh, I lived in Singapore for a while, and nobody was using Amazon. They used、uh, something else. So, there's a fight、uh, in the world uh, in, uh, uh, in the data platform.、Uh, so, the question is where the data go?、Uh, sorry for the Chinese leaders. Uh, to visualize data flow, I think the best way is to, to look at the map of the submarine、uh, map. So,、uh, the data is running through the South China Sea and、uh, converge in Singapore and go through the Malacca Strait and go to India. So, the, from China and Japan,、uh, the, So, this is the traffic of the maritime traffic. So, it's perfectly match the, the map of the submarine. So, from the 16th century, the same thing. So, the South China Sea and the, the Maracas Strait and the Singapore is the choking point of the traffic. Now it's data, and 200 years ago, it was ships. So, talking about trade and investment and the data flow, 
uh, this is important. In the Pacific is a place we should focus on. So it's broaden the view of the Pacific Ocean. So from Canada, uh, the US, the thick line is running to Japan and the east part of Asia. So uh, this is important. South China Sea, Malacca Strait, and Aleutian Islands. And we often talk about the South Pacific recently, Fiji, Solomon, the Chinese coming into the, this area. So of course, this is important because data is running from the US to uh, Australia. So this is a major uh, line. So, so if you grip these areas, you can control the supply chain of data. That's something we have to look at. Okay, here is Mr. Biden. Right after he took the position in the White House, he made an uh, announcement in the White House, gathered the CEOs of the semiconductor companies. And he said, uh, uh, semiconductor is a, is a uh, infrastructure, not just a bridge uh, or the roads or the port. Semiconductor is a, is a is the infrastructure. And of course, there was a shortage of a semiconductor for Detroit. So, so he has to tackle the issue. But at the same time, he used uh, the term uh, national security so often. So in his mind and in this administration, uh, national security with the semiconductor is a big issue. Okay, but semiconductor is very difficult to fabricate nowadays. Not so many company can make it. So this is a, just a picture I have borrowed from the Intel and the other manufacturers of uh, semiconductor. Uh, it's very beautiful, but it's very fine. Um, it, it's a, to make the semiconductor is like uh, building an entire city in a, such a small space of the millimeter size. So it's very, really, not so many companies can make it. Okay, the supply chain has developed globally. This shows uh, where the semiconductor uh, make a traffic, I mean, traded uh, between Taiwan, China, ASEAN. You know, we can see that it's, a, it's the biggest part of the supply chain run through Southeast Asia and East Asia. So, so how is the supply chain be developed? Uh, this is a very simplified diagram I drew. First, there are a few companies uh, uh, that, have a, that have a blueprint and uh, it's a basic element of the structure. And then designing companies such as Apple Silicon, Qualcomm, High Silicon. Then there's a, a manufacturers, which is TSMC. And this is a very important company, TSMC, Taiwanese company. Uh, probably the only company in the world with the capability to manufacture state-of-the-art chips. Taiwan, where this company is located, is on the edge of South China Sea with a dense concentration of Chinese military bases on the, the other side of the, the strait. So it's not a safe place, I should say. As you know, China claims the Taiwan is part of uh, their country and the Western uh, nations, including Canada and Japan, respect Taiwan's position. So stability in Taiwan Strait is essentially for the piece of the, uh, in, very important for the, the, for the, the piece of the Indo-Pacific. If we look at where the companies on the semiconductor supply chain are located, the US and the Taiwan, uh, dominates the market. Uh, IP here, core IP is uh, in a blue blueprint I talked about. And uh, EDA means uh, our well, software to uh, to design the, as a semiconductor circuit. And the designer, design companies, the wafer is, is, uh, is what uh, Mr. Biden showed. Foundry uh, means uh, factories. So look at this diagram. Uh, US and Taiwan, if you combine the US and Taiwan, basically you can complete the supply chain. Yeah, of course, Japan, it has a big share in the wafer 
but uh, the technology of wafer is not necessarily uh, uh, advanced. I mean, you know, the gap between the TSMC and the other uh, fabricator is big, but it, Japan's advantage of wafer, I don't know how, uh, how far they are running. Uh, China and uh, Korea is uh, catching up soon. So perhaps many people in Canada have never heard of TSMC. Oh, neither had the Japanese until recently. However, uh, it's a company with the best technology in the world. What happens inside of the factory is a secret. So even we journalists cannot, are not allowed to enter. So we don't know what's going on in, in the factory. It's a very secret. The one on the left, the one in the left, it's so so advanced chip, okay? And uh, the farther to the right, it's uh, more technically difficult. And sorry for the writing in the Chinese letters here. Uh, emerald green is Taiwan, and uh, red is Korea, and green, the deep green is China, and the blue is the US. So as you see, most of the world's advanced semiconductor are uh, made only in Taiwan. This is one of the reasons why I am nervous about Taiwan. Uh, without semiconductors, all industry would come to a halt. And uh, that means a geopolitical challenge is to protect the Indo-Pacific supply chain leading to Taiwan. TSMC, it's so important that US, Japan, Germany, and China are trying to bring their factory uh, inside their own country. Uh, the Trump and the Biden administration will invest over, I think, uh, $10 billion in Arizona. Japan uh, invited the TSMC to Kumamoto Kyushu too. And of course, South Korea has uh, Samsung, the world's second largest company. Uh, they are also trying to trying very hard to build their own ecosystem. Uh, we should not forget that uh, TSMC is also building a factories in China. You know, it, 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 this is their strategy to keep a balance between China and the US, as they do not bet only on the one side. It's clear that economic security will not be enhanced without controlling this uh, single company. So TSMC is so important. Until now, our foundries have been built by the, the semiconductor companies as uh, subcontractors, but in fact, the, the opposite is true. Uh, the world design companies are more dependent on TSMC. But the competition is not only in the Indo-Pacific. There is uh, another choke point of supply chain, ASML, a Dutch company, okay? ASML is the only company in the world at the time that can build the equipment to fabricate super fine chips. TSMC, Samsung, IBM, all they have to ask ASML to sell its equipment, their machine to them. So there's no way Europe would let the ASML go, go out. The, the company is strategically and extremely important. They will not let a foreign country control it. So they wanna keep it. It's, um, it's a precious asset for EU. So even the, the US government cannot really control. So the single company, ASML, is an uh, irreplicable, uh, how to say in English, e irreplaceable, yeah, sorry, and uh, valuable asset for Europe. Uh, even among the same Western countries, there is a competition, uh, EU, and, EU and the US, uh, Albany and the Lubin is the place we should look at, okay? Um, very cutting edge on the ahead of TSMC and the ASML is going on in the US and Europe. Uh, the nanotech complex in Albany, and uh, the, this is the one where the IBM at the center. And the Belgium, now uh, there's um, uh, the organization called the IMEC, IMEC. Those two are the, the organization we have to look at. So the, the, those two are fighting each other. So this is a heavy uh, competition, 
in uh, next generation semiconductor. Now, uh, I hear that Canada excels in uh, cutting edge research field such as AI and quantum computing. So actually Canada and Japan have close tie with the US, right? But I believe we must also protect our technological independence in order to retain our bargaining power. That, that's my opinion. A middle power like uh, Japan and Canada uh, should also play its own role uh, rather than relying on the US, EU or China. Uh, this will ultimately will lead to the stability in the Indo-Pacific region. Okay, on the other camp, China. Uh, China has a Belt and Road Initiative and has also launched a new concept of a digital Silk Road. The strategy is to strengthen the, the governance of a semiconductor and data supply chain. This is not necessarily a bad thing, I think, but uh, the decoupling of China and the West over advanced technology uh, is not really good. I mean, it, it would undermine the regional stability. So to counter China's, China's strong hegemonic orientation, the United States, Japan, Australia, and India, four nations have formed a group called Quad. Uh, it was conceived as a military security from, from framework at the beginning, but it has also come to have an uh, economic security function now. The digital is at the center. Okay, Quad Square surrounds Taiwan and Asia. Uh, this location is a key point uh, in the semiconductor supply chain and the data flow. So uh, Quad is a, it's a system to cover and embrace the distribution. Uh, it's called the nine dash line uh, dro dro drawn by China. And uh, they claim this is the territory of China or oh, entire South China Sea. This belongs to, to China. This is what they say. Japan and Canada should build a closer relations with Southeast Asian countries, such as Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, because uh, to be good friends of ASEAN, I think Canada and Japan have to, they, they, we share the value, uh, common value. So to, to have the strong voice from the West, uh, as a middle power, uh, we should say we should use the same voice toward Asia. So ASEAN should be a friend of us. So okay, the progress of digital economy, digital technology in China, uh, we should not underestimate. It's remarkable. Um, this it's like uh, AI and robotics and the semiconductors. They are making a rapid progress in in R and D. Okay, those are the, the topics, topics we should look at when it comes to the Chinese technologies. The, what I wanted to show you is this. Okay. This is a place called uh, uh, in Shenzhen. I think the, the ambassador McDonald, McDonald is quite familiar with this place. It's near Hong Kong. And this place is Hua is, uh, I don't know how we should call it. It's a place, a trading place for the semiconductor and uh, electronic uh, components. Uh, everything is can be sold. You know, this is because of the Asian city, so a lot of noise, and somebody is sleeping, running, shouting. You know, this energy is a magnet to attract uh, uh, investors, inventors, entrepreneurs from all over the world. So this guy I saw is a trader of a semiconductor. And the foreign inventors just show up to the small shop 
and with the blueprint handwriting and show him, uh, this is the one I want to make. And it, it's kind of consultation. So he says uh, something like, uh, okay, to make your uh, idea, uh, uh, to make it products out of your idea, so you're gonna use, use this semiconductor or this semiconductor. So he can he recommend to the inventors. Uh, this is how the thing is going on you know, uh, digital economy is one side of the, one face of digital economy. Uh, I went to the fire champion with my friend, uh, entrepreneur in Japan, and he is not really interested in geopolitics. He is interested in technology, engineering, and I asked him, why you come to Shenzhen so often? And he said, if you want to make something different, the society, or if you can do meaningful things with engineering to the society. So where are you gonna go? Not to Akihabara or Silicon Valley, but I would go to Shenzhen because it is exciting. So the, the, a lot of engineers, inventors, entrepreneurs wanna to go to Shenzhen to feel that excitement. This is something we have to look at, okay. Uh, do does Japan has that such a place to attract the the motivated engineers designers? No, really. And uh, what about the Silicon Valley? Yeah, of course, there's a lot of talents there. But uh, is is it the attractive and uh, energetic place? I don't know. We have to think about that. So China should not be underestimated. Uh, of course, there's a lot of problems geopolitically and politically and economically and protectionism and trade. So we have a bunch of uh, problems with China, but at the same time, China has a place uh, like a magnet to attract the talents from all over the world. Okay, uh, this is a drone system in Shenzhen. It's already being used in the society, so. Uh, you, you don't see drones flying over the Tokyo sky, but in Shenzhen and Shanghai, it's, uh, it's just a, a usual in a uh, daily uh, scene that you can see. So how to, the question is how to uh, make a new order of digital economy. So TPP was a good challenge because there was a, uh, clause, uh, digital clause, and then what was trying to uh, establish a new rules of a digital economy, uh, including a semiconductor supply chain and data flow, but US dropped it off and uh, China uh, raised their hand to, lend, to join the TPP. So uh, I don't really think the TPP was successful to establish their new order in a digital economy. But there's another uh, interesting development in the Indo-Pacific that is uh, this one, deeper digital economy uh, partnership agreement. Uh, it was agreement with, of uh, Singapore, New Zealand, and the Chile, small nations, three small nations. And uh, the union of those small nations Indo-Pacific countries will not increase the volume of trade. Uh, it's a tiny nations. So will it have any impact to the world? So that's a big question. I think it's, it's the answer is yes and no. This agreement is not about increasing trade. It is a strategy, strategy itself. Uh, it provides a foundation for the rules and a new international rules of economic security. And uh, the, the rules are not complete yet. The rule will be discussed and create a new uh, idea. And TPP was, TPP was originally uh, just like, like this, you know, tiny agreement created by Singapore, New Zealand, and Chile. That is the origin of TPP. And the US discovered this uh, small agreement and grew it bigger, like a snowball. 
as if it's a tiny stone inside as a core and the big guy is roaring and pushing and eventually it makes a big, big ball. So that was uh, uh, the, the TPP. And the deeper may have some potential uh, like, uh, like TPP. Uh, Canada has made a quick uh, strategic, uh, strategic uh, move and they want to join the DEPA and the Korea too. Uh, Japan has not moved so far. Uh, China has raised you know, its hand to be included. They are trying to be on the side of making the rules. So superpowers like the US and China are too big to be agile. The small countries are very quick to move. I believe the middle powers, uh, Canada and Japan, have a role to play in building the economic growth, economic order in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so there's a lot of things we have to do. And Canada, uh, Japan, probably Australia, uh, have their. They, we should have the. We should have make a, the middle power strategy and uh, shake hands and uh, face the, the big issues we have challenge. I have to stop here and uh, let's continue the, the, the topics later on to so broaden the, the topics into the, the wider uh, theme like uh, uh, digital economy or economic security. Thank you. So thank you very much. That was that was an excellent <laughs> discussion there. We've got a lot of material to cover there. And I know it's like I a myself, movie. <laughs> yeah, it was wonderful. I've got lots yeah. of questions. It was a very, a very deep uh, discussion there about economic security with lots of rich data. And so I, I'm looking forward to the discussion. We'll go ahead and, and move right into uh, Lynn McDonald's uh, response to that. Um, and, and then we'll have a moderated discussion after after Patrick LeBon speaks as well. So go ahead, Lynn. Okay, um, good morning. Um, bonjour and um, uh, un grand merci. Thanks again to the University of Ottawa for the uh, kind invitation to join this uh, this fascinating panel. And I wanted to add my my voice in, in expressing my appreciation for uh, uh, Mr. Ota's um, really um, thought-provoking and uh, rich, interesting presentation, which um, has given me uh, a, a lot of a lot of food for thought, and I'm looking forward to the to the discussion that 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 follows, and also um, for His Excellency's uh, remarks at the beginning of of the session. Um, some of which I will I will maybe uh, echo uh, a little bit in in the observations I'm 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 going to 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 share um, and so I I wanted to um, start by uh, sort of stepping back from some of the uh, rich detail that um, Otasan provided and just um, give some some context from which. Canada, I think, having heard the ambassador's remarks, is, is approaching some of these issues in, in quite a similar way to Japan. So um, when we think about um, how to foster resilient supply chains and, and collaboration with like-minded partners, you know, this this is this has been, you know, I think a focus of attention for for quite quite some time. However, it's really been brought into much more immediate light um, by the, the impact of the pandemic. Um, as the ambassador noted, and and also by um, the 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 recent in, invasion, illegal invasion by Russia of, of Ukraine, which has which has really shone a light on um, the vulnerabilities caused by global disruptions, um, whatever the source, um, and and also recognizing that we've also seen over the past number of years some examples of coercive economic behavior that also. Um, and I think, as, as uh, Mr. Oda rightly showed, there are some real choke points and vulnerabilities that can uh, can put all of our um, economies and prosperity at, at, at risk. So, um, what what um, I would like to note is is that um, similar again to what's been said before is that um, you know not all countries are not alone as they grapple and think about these issues and. 
And certainly um, from a perspective of our bilateral relationship, um, Canada and Japan, as has been noted, do have um, come at this with, with some, um, I guess, good basis for shared approach and, and, and collaboration or cooperation. And in, indeed, um, we're already working together in a number of areas with implications for economic security. So it was noted by the ambassador um, when the, our um, prime ministers met and, and indeed when our foreign ministers met in 2021, they outlined some shared priorities for the Indo-Pacific, Indo in, including commitments to cooperate in a number of areas that have resonance for economic security, um, including rule of, rule of law, um, free trade, um, yes, the, the, the nomenclature free trade coming back again, um, energy security with reference to supply chain resilience, um, also some environment and climate change, which um, again, connect into the, the topic of, of critical minerals and, and supplies as we look towards clean technologies and so forth. We, we believe from a Canadian perspective that there are certainly opportunities for even closer cooperation for Canada and Japan to work to strengthen our domestic regimes to safeguard against existing and emerging threats to our economic um, security and to, um, to safeguard our, our prosperity. I'll just note um, for some context setting how important um, an economic partner Japan is for Canada. Um, thousands of our, our, um, our population, our communities, uh, so sort of benefit from the confidence that Japan and Japanese companies put into our economy. Uh, Japan is Canada's largest source of foreign direct investment from Asia um, and, and third Lord largest source of foreign direct investment globally, and also our fourth largest export market. So in other words, Japan consumes um, a, a lot of, of Canadian goods and, and, and products, but it's, it's a reciprocal uh, relationship in that Japan has also received um, a great deal of Canadian investment into um, into Japan, and I believe we rank as Japan's third largest trading partner out, outside of, of Asia and Oceania, behind only the United States and Germany. Um, so we see, um, you know, a, a positive picture in terms of the bilateral relationship, but there's more to it than than just the scale of the bilateral trade and investment flows. We, as I've noted share um, quite a remarkable degree of complementarity in terms of values that underpin our, our societies and, and our relationship. Um, for example, we've proven to each other our steadfast adherence to market economy principles, our commitment to reliable and resilient supply chains. And these are some of the factors that, that foster trust and form the basis of, of business partnerships that our private sector then um, explore and endeavor. So we, we um, as, as um, Ota-san has rightly uh, noted, there's been good examples of where supply chains can be disrupted. We've also seen um, close to home examples of protectionism, flaunting of long established trade rules. Both Canada and Japan have rejected those behaviors and we recognize them as threats to our economic security. So in, in bilateral context, multilaterally at the WTO, CPTPP, um, we're working together to reinforce supply chains, ensure quality infrastructure investment, counter examples of economic coercion. And um, as our ambassador shared in um, to Japan, shared in some remarks to the to the diet not so long ago, you know, we believe we need to celebrate and build upon our dependable, respectful, resilient economic partnership when facing some of these challenges. So I'll just touch briefly on um, semiconductors because uh, I, although uh, Freely admitting, I'm I'm no expert in this area. I just I, I wanted to pick up on the on the point that um, Mr. Ota raised about Canada and artificial intelligence because this is an area where our government has been putting quite a great deal of, of attention and priority into, and and we believe that the application of of AI and machine learning will um, or has the prospect of dramatically accelerating the semiconductor. Um, industry over the next few years. So there's quite um, a, a focus in terms of using um, our national AI strategy um, and our expertise in that space to actually uh, contribute to the growth of the semiconductor industry. So we do have already um, quite a number of the world's largest and leading semiconductor producers and designers, um, including TSMC, uh, present here in, in, in Canada, 
drawn, um, we think, potentially uh, by our network of, of trade agreements, also our educated workforce, the institutional support and leadership, as I've mentioned in AI and quantum, um, as well as some of our um, ability to attract through um, through our programs, um, such as our super cluster innovations um, that the industry, can, or I said, I should say, using the correct uh, term for our ministry now, uh, it has been building out across the, across the country. And so as we see the implications of the semiconductor shortage ripple through the global economy, um, you know, we're continuing to deliver the message that Canada offers some uh, attractive proposition for um, it building up that uh, th the contribution we can make to the growth of that industry, particularly drawing on um, some of the of the developments that are happening at, say, the Vector Institute at U of T or University of Alberta on reinforcement learning in the area of, of um, artificial um, intelligence. And so. I think uh, you know we see it as a as an attractive point for drawing in investment into Canada, um, but also an area where we can contribute and and collaborate with Japan on the on the technology side. Um, my final um, comments, and then I'll leave uh, uh, hopefully enough time for um, uh, Professor LeBlanc and 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 uh, discussion. But I was quite intrigued by the suggestion from Mr. Ota about Canada and Japan needing to do more with ASEAN. Um, having just come back from five years in in Singapore, I, I couldn't uh, agree more and, and would note that um, a number of our ministers, um, uh, our defense minister, our trade minister were recently in um, in Singapore. Uh, Canada is is um, engaging in, in a uh, free trade discussions with ASEAN at the moment. Um, and as you rightly noted, have signaled our interest in the in the digital um, economy partnership agreement, DIPA, um, and and I I can say for certain that um, Minister Eng, our, our Minister of, of um, I'll simplify her title down to Minister of, of, of Trade, um, but is very committed to ASEAN and has spoken about um, launching a, a gateway to ASEAN, potentially located in in uh, in Singapore, um, and is very keen for Canadian companies um, and and so on to to really see. Um, using ASEAN as a, um, as a, uh, I, I guess, a focal point for pursuing the trade diversification um, uh, sort of mandate that she's, she's following and, and, and most importantly, to build up the economic linkages um, through to the Indo-Pacific. Um, I saw firsthand just how engaged Japan is um, in, in, um, in terms of its relationship with Singapore, but also throughout ASEAN. And I think that's an area where you know, potentially there's room for some uh, further collaboration partnership as we as we look to um, to continue to build up our engagement in that extremely important region of the world. So I'll I'll, I'll pause there, but thank you again for the uh, invitation to to join the panel, and I'm looking forward to the ensuing discussion. Um, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Lynn. I will now move on to uh, Professor Leblanc. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Good evening, depending on, on where you are. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll fascinating uh, presentations, discussions so far. Um, I want to bring it up kind of one level, uh, you know, like in, looking a bit less at, at the trees and, and, and the forest, but, you know, kind of even broader. Um, three points I, I, I want to make. The first one is 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 the, the question that uh, ultimately, when we talk about economic security, that we have to ask ourselves: What's the goal? What's the ultimate goal that we're trying to achieve? Then the second question is: Once we've identified that goal, is what are the best ways to achieve uh, the identified goal? And the third point is, and and has already been mentioned quite a bit, for countries like Canada and Japan who. You know, stand in between the the the, the great powers, right? The economic powers, so the U.S., the European Union, uh, and and China. You know, how, how, given the goal, you know, what? How can we even more specifically uh, achieve uh, those goals? So, going to the first question, when we talk about economic security, um, Mr. Ota gave the, uh, obviously a great presentation on on the importance of semiconductors. Talked also about you know the movement of data when we talk about the digital economy, but one of the the things that 
um, I, I see, and 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 this is, I guess, is 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 very present uh, in in certainly the discussions in the U.S. and the European Union, uh, but even more so in the U.S. I would think is really is the goal when we talk about economic security, especially when we talk about supply chains. Is it really about resilience, as already been mentioned, referring to the choke points that Mr. Ota? Uh, talked about and also um, Lynn uh, mentioned in terms of, you know, do we want to eliminate those choke points? Do we want to, um, you know, create alternative choke points uh, that are less threatened? Uh, so moving things away, let's say from Taiwan to the US to Europe. Uh, so, so that's really the, the first question. But Associated with that, and 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 a lot of the discourse and 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 that are coming out is is whether it's also about Western domination, or uh, you know, in terms of semiconductors, right? In the U.S., sometimes the, the debate is seems to be about okay, well, we need to bring things back home uh, because and and we cannot let China uh, dominate, right? And and certainly a lot of the issues around five G. Uh, uh, around semiconductors, the, in terms of you know the export and, and import controls, or even investment screening, uh, sometimes the, the 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 feeling is that it, it's not just a, it's not so much about resilience. It's really about oh well, we can't let China get away or or get in front of us in terms of technology. We got to slow China down. Um, so there seems to be a a a a, a sort of um, uh paradox here as to what what exactly are we trying to pursue is it really to cooperate uh to reduce risk in terms of choke points uh whether it's because of as we've seen because of the pandemic or because of war or because of ill intentions on on other countries or is it really about preventing um or trying to to to, to maintain dominance in terms of the digital economy in terms of se semiconductors uh, and, 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 and new technologies, whether we, there was a mention of artificial intelligence, quantum. So in a way, you know, the West uh, trying to, you know, stay ahead of competitors, right? So in a way, a very uh, uh, competition, uh, you know, competing uh, uh, competition mindset, as opposed to more of a cooperation to say, okay, there are risks, how can we uh, reduce them? So these are the, the, the two two elements that um, I, I would ask and said, we need to ask ourselves and be very clear, what are the goals? Um, once we've identified those goals, the, the question then is, okay, how do we achieve that, right? We have a number of tools or instruments that are available, uh, subsidies, right? Import export restrictions, uh, investment screening, right? Um, now, a lot of the, 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 th the another thing in terms of international cooperation, but relating to those instruments is the, the so-called French shoring, right? Should we, um, again, uh, fragment in a way the international economy so that only friends, and then again, how do you define friends, uh, work together, allow each other to trade, allow each other to invest, share technology, cooperate on innovation, but let's say not with China, at least from a, a US perspective, that, that seems to be the case. And then uh, another, I think, important element, countries, yes, have to cooperate to achieve, depending on, on what the goal is, but then you have to bring business on board. I think, you know, um, Mr. Ota uh, said something very interesting when he, he presented the, the video in, in, in Shenzhen, uh, where uh, and, and, and his you know friend who's an entrepreneur, you know business people want to do business, right? They want to find the, the right technology, the right inputs, the right people, but they're not ultimately interested in geo geopolitics. They're only interested in it when it prevents them from doing business, right? But obviously, from a, a, a political perspective, geopolitics, uh, economic development, you know those things uh, actually matter, and this is why we're here. But the big question is, is how do you bring business on board? Because if, you know, governments can impose all sorts of regulations and restrictions and all that, but will business follow? You know, that's a big question. The U.S., for instance, you know, has already uh, adopted a number of restrictions, but then, you know, business lobby for exceptions and things like that. And, the, and, and, and so if we're going to be effective, depending on what the goal is, we need to have uh, business uh, and government work together. 
domestically, but also internationally as, as we cooperate. Otherwise, we might spend a lot of money, a lot of energy, and, and ultimately, um, uh, you know, w waste, uh, waste our time and, and money. Another question that also we, we need to ask, uh, again, the presentation focused a lot on semiconductors and their importance, um, but, you know, is it, and, and then there was a question of AI and quantum, but again, if resilience is the issue, well, then obviously is resilience is supply chain in a number of things. But if, it, it, if the, the idea is more, you know, staying ahead of the curve when it comes to innovation in, in, in the digital economy and sort of the future economy, well, which technologies are we gonna focus on? Do we need to focus on all of them? Do, should we focus on, on, on some of them? So is it semiconductors as the basis for pretty much everything else right now? Or is it like we said in Canada, focusing on AI or quantum computing? Is that where energy is? Because obviously, certainly for, for smaller countries, especially in Canada, we can't do it all, right? Uh, we may not have the financial resources. We might not have the, the intellectual resources. So at some point, we also have to be strategic in terms of uh, how we're going to go about this. Again, depending on what the goal is, uh, I certainly... Uh, I'm always a little bit worried about the idea of, of maintaining Western dominance, if you want, and economic dominance and, 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 and you know, uh, technological advancement, because the, the danger is that, well, it can lead to more protectionism, but resilience can also be used uh, for protectionist reasons. So we, we have to be very careful, and that's was already being mentioned, uh, you know, finding the balance between resilience and efficiency, but also uh, preventing from moving uh, towards uh, protectionism, uh, because obviously there are going to be a lot of forces will say, hey, you know, uh, we, we want to, to uh, protection, right? Sometimes I, I, I kind of joke that, you know, businesses are open to competition as long, as long as they're the ones competing, but they don't want necessarily others to compete against them. Right, so there's always that dichotomy that, that takes place and, and businesses will lobby and position themselves in order to protect their interests and, and have market access, but then prevent others from having uh, access to their own markets, right? Anyways, I'll stop here and, 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 and look forward to the, the, the rest of the discussion. So thank you very much. I think we can uh, ask Mr. Ota to first re reply to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, what I am concerned about is the moves uh, made by EU and the US and the China, it's a major powers. Uh, looking at the Washington DC, what happened in the Trump, on the Trump era was the revive, revival of 301, section 301, which is a unilateral sanction major, right? And uh, it's still there. And uh, Mr. Trump used uh, the other weapon, uh, section 232, and which is a quite old, uh, law uh, introduced in uh, Kennedy at, under Kennedy administration in uh, Cold War era. And it, it's been there, but it's not been used for a long time. But Mr. Trump found it and he realized this is a great weapon. So just wheel the weapon and uh, you know, apply the unilateral sanction all the nations uh, in uh, uh, steel and aluminium export to the U.S. Uh, market, right? And it's still there, and uh, sanctions are still in effect. Uh, Biden, Mr. Biden, did not stop using it, uh, even though they uh, uh, they released the, the sanction on uh, steel, but the steel aluminium is under under the sanction sanction so called. And EU is going to introduce the new law. Uh, anti-coercion initiative. I, I don't know the exact name of it, but the, it's a, another um, unilateral measures to, uh, you know, they say it, uh, they have to have deterrence power uh, against the Chinese, uh, uh, well, threat. And China, of course, has the unilateral measure. So all of those uh, three major uh, superpowers want, want to have the weapons and supply chain, uh, as Professor Simon mentioned, uh, supply chain can be uh, weaponized. You know, if, if you grip the, the choking point, 
you can use the supply chain as a weapon. Uh, I don't think this is healthy. And the reason why a foundry is uh, uh, developed in Taiwan and Korea, and in the West Coast of the US, they have a bunch of uh, design companies. It's, it's thanks to globalization, because this is uh, it's a rational uh, consequence of globalization. Uh, there's a free trade, so it's better to focus on the designing or the manufacturing. So everybody's happy, win-win situation. But now everybody want to have the uh, TSMC into their country. So they want to uh, close their ecosystem within their, uh, with, inside of the border. So it's a direction they are heading for. It's totally different from what we did in the past 20, 30 years. So that, that's my concern. So, so the question that Professor uh, Leblon raised is how, what we should do, Canada, Japan, or other uh, so-called middle powers. Because major powers, US, China, EU has to, see, I think they have to go after this reality. So it's understandable. They want to, they want to have new weapons, but, uh, but Japan and Canada is in a different position, right? So uh, uh, we cannot just follow them. Uh, we should have, we should uh, have the same voice and we should embrace the uh, liberal uh, trade liberalization and we have to fight against uh, protectionism uh, that we have to do. And to have the friend, to have ASEAN nations, they are making a balance between the US and China. Uh, they don't want to choose one of them, right? So they are swaying always. So we have to anchor, we have to give them a chance to anchor their position so that is a role that Japan or Canada can do uh, because the US, China, EU cannot. So that, well, I don't think I can, uh, this is a uh, good answer to your questions, but uh, that is what, I, that is the thought I have now. Okay, thank you. I think what we can do now is start moving to uh, questions uh, that have come up. Um, there are already two from the audience. I have some for myself, but I will uh, start with the ones from, from the audience here. We have one um, asking about you, about the CPTPP, if you could say a few more words about that. Um, is that not an example of a middle power arrangement? Do you, would you like me to... Uh to okay. take a stab at that one i'm 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 happy to to talk a little bit about um you know about the the cptpp um i think it, it was correctly um you know correctly noted by um uh mr ota in his presentation that this this was interesting because it started out as a as a very um a small group of countries um similar to the DIPA now um and then it, it you know ex, ex, expanded out um and and i think um you know it when you look at the constellation of who are are, are members of the cptpp um you know originally and right up until the the kind of last moment the us had been a real driving force behind it um in in the end it wasn't able to to sign on um but uh you, i i think it would be in my own you know my personal view is is that given how much they were involved in the shaping of the agreement um it may not be accurate to to term it a, a true sort of middle power from the, the the over the whole lifespan of of how the those that agreement was negotiated and, and and came to be i think how the the members of the cptpp look at it as being very much as as providing a um uh a structure in place to ensure um, the the continued um, ability of countries such as Canada and Japan to con um, and others who are interested to to continue to enjoy um, the benefits of of open trade within a rules based um, environment that sets out some sort of norms of of, of understanding and behavior between the, the the parties including in some interesting new areas such as digital um I fully agree that it didn't cover all all aspects or it doesn't have all all um parties in its 
same way that a WTO agreement would, but it, it still sets out some um, some uh, some some basic frame framework in that in that regard. And and I think you know from the perspective of would it stay you know intact? Well, the UK of course is interested has signaled an interest in joining. Um, and I think um, you know that the and I I can't speak for Japan, but I I, I think that the between the parties right now the thought is is that if there are other economies demonstrating, you know, a willingness and an ability to meet the the rules of the CPTPP and the um, you know ambitious market access uh, commitments, and have a clear record of meeting their trade obligations, then you know the agreement is not is not limited to the to the current membership. Um, but decisions to expand the CPTPP are made by consensus by all parties that are currently currently involved. So, um, but it, it is an example of how I think with with clearly with Japan's strong leadership, even when the U.S. Um, stepped back, um, it was due to the the um, uh, the push at that that time of, of um, Prime Minister Abe, if I'm not mistaken, that that really drew that agreement to um, to a close and didn't have it um, um, sort of collapse. Uh, at even when the the US wasn't able to sign on so I think you know it's something that certainly in terms of ensuring strong implementation of the of the uh, provisions as well as looking um, and with care and interest on new applicants is something that a good example of where Canada and Japan continue to um, cooperate and have quite a lot of shared uh, shared interest and perspective good thank you Mr o, would you like to say something to that Well, I think the fundamental idea of TPP, uh, as well as CPTPP, is to create create a region where you can trade and make an investment freely, right? And it's safe zone. Yeah. Uh, and uh, within this region, there's no choke point. I mean, you no know, supply chain is develop developing everywhere, so you don't need to worry about somebody is take the advantage of the choke point. I think that is a basic idea, but but the it's, U.S. is not there, and uh, and all the the member states of the of the of the TPP or CPTPP is now interested. They're interested in having more technology, uh, more um, a choking point. So the direction is in reality uh, is is. Um, it's different from what we thought. So that what we can do uh, should be should we lead the discussion or the so just wait and see what's going to happen and wait for the movement by the U.S. China. Well, I don't really think so. Oh, the one thing uh, just a reminder was was uh, in Albany and uh, Belgium. I talked about in Albany. Many uh, companies from the Japan, EU, or China, uh, no, not China, comes to the Albany and to share the information and technology and the knowledge and experience. But it's uh, in the IBM's territory. So basically, this is IBM's place. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, in uh, Belgium, the IMEX system is open innovation. So uh, the Japanese companies, the Canadian companies, all there. And mm -hmm. uh, Germans and everybody, but uh, you cannot kick Chinese out. The China is there, so the question is, which is uh, better? And you know, uh, if we can foster the model of IMEC, the, the Belgian model, then we're gonna have the peaceful and a stable world. But uh, if you wanna uh, take advantage of the ownership of technology and uh, the ideas from others and uh, take advantage of the gathering of the information. I, I don't really think um, it's, it will lead to the, the stable and uh, liberal world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to develop an idea of open innovation and how to share the knowledge and technology and don't have any choking point in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. We have another question from a former ambassador from Japan to Canada, Mr. Numata-san. He asks us, um, how can Japan impress upon its public the importance of Canada as a middle power partner? 
and how can Canada impress upon its public the importance of Japan as a middle power partner? So who would like to respond to that first? Oda-san, would you like to begin? Yeah, well, hello, Mr. Numara. It's a long time, and I'll see. Uh, he's a good guitar player, by the way. <laughs> uh, what I think is the difference between between the Canada and Australia, for example, is is, is uh, the Australia is fighting against China, even though they rely on Chinese market. So this is there. Are facing a dilemma, so being sandwiched by the economic interest and the national security interest. But Canada, at the same time, see you know, that you guys are dependent on the Chinese market. Uh, so the the question is how uh, well you can handle the issue uh, if you make the clear position against China or the U.S. Do you have to uh, then the the the, the the chance for you is, is not a war. And uh, I don't know, but Japan, Canada, uh, Japan is the same. In, in the business wise, uh, Japan need to have the, the strong relation with China, well, the US as well. And I, I, I check the, the number of export, uh, export of semiconductor from the US to China. Actually, it is increasing, even though there was a sanction. So the business people are, uh, not really interested in geopolitics. They want to make the business, as the Professor Leblon said. So, so and they want to hide. They, they, they don't want to be like Intel or the Qualcomm and uh, Texas Instruments. Quietly, those people are working hard in Washington, D.C. to convince the government that uh, they can export the Chinese market. But we have to have the open discussion on it, right? Uh, Let's see the reality. China's there. We cannot, uh, we cannot make a China out of the world. It is there. Is there. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the things we have to do is to talk candidly and uh, uh, talk about the politics at the same time, the business. Mm -hmm. This is something that Canada or Japan can do, I believe. Okay. Patrick? Yeah, uh, let me build on that. Uh, I think uh, the idea of, of you know, Canada and, and Japan and, 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 and other countries, other middle powers, um, you know, offering uh, <laughs> an open system, you know, rules-based um, is, is, is very attractive. And, and certainly, um, you know, the, the question, if, if not Canada and, and Japan and, and, and other uh, similarly placed countries, then who? Because uh, it really feels, uh, as, as mentioned, that, you know, the EU, the, the, the US and, and, and China are uh, in, in a, a very competitive mindset uh, against each other and, and, and using a, a lot of you know, tools. And, and some of them are actually protectionist uh, in nature to you know, it, it, it's all in the name of security and, and, and protecting their economy and all that. But, but the, 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 ultimately, the danger is that it leads to fragmentation. And, and when there is fragmentation between uh, these three economic poles, well, then, you know, the countries in between, whether it's, it's, it's uh, Canada or Japan, suffer or even ASEAN. And I think, again, uh, Mr. Ota made uh, very clear that ASEAN countries and other countries don't want to be forced to choose uh, because, and, and, and neither should Canada, neither should Japan. Uh, you know, if, if, if all of a sudden there is fragmentation and, and, and you know, the, the big, you know, polls are asking to say, okay, well, you got to choose, you know, it's the U.S. or nothing, uh, then um, it can be very costly. And then ultimately also it means that then we have to follow the rules that let's say the US, if from a Canadian perspective, uh, that the US will want us to, 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 to choose, right? It's like, well, if you don't want to be, if you, it's, you're with us or, or, or not, and if you are with us, these are the rules. Um, so I think that that's a very dangerous approach, and and the same thing for Japan. But Japan doesn't have doesn't want to have to choose between the U.S. or China or or Europe. These are all very important trade partners for Japan, the same as it is for Canada. So 
Um, obviously, maintaining an international system uh, is very important, whether it's the WTO, whether it's the CPTPP as a very good example of, in a way, uh, J Japanese leadership and, 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 and Canada supporting uh, Japan's efforts in, in a way, maintaining CPTPP alive. But I would add to what has already been said, I think it's, you know, where there could be more cooperation and coordination between Canada and Japan is vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. and, and certainly vis-a-vis -vis Europe, maybe less so in, in China, but, you know, that, 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 that remains to be seen. Uh, certainly right now, Canada doesn't have a lot of influence in, in China uh, because of, of, of diplomatic tensions. Um, but in the U.S., you know, Canada has shown, whether it's the, with the NAFTA renegotiations, that we can have influence, even if, if we are a small country, and so can Japan. And, 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 and I think we should not be afraid to lobby and you'll know, be part of the lobbying that is taking place you know uh, again uh, mr ota mentioned companies intel and others lobbying uh, quietly well we can do the same sometimes quietly sometimes less so to because we, you know there are allies there uh that who believe there are people who believe in an open system who believe in in wanting to trade with canada and japan who don't want necessarily closure who don't want um you know every country for itself uh, so I think we should not be shy to coordinate our activities. And this obviously means interacting at all levels of government. Again, I think that the, the Team Canada approach to the NAFTA renegotiations was, was, was very powerful. And that meant, you know, interacting at the municipal level, at, at the state level, at the federal level in Washington and, and you know, um, uh, state capitals in the U.S., and, 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 and the same in, 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 in the EU. The EU seems to be obviously more open to uh, and, you know, uh, maintaining a rules-based order, open system and all that. And IMEC is, is a great example. So again, we need to make sure that we find the allies that we have internationally, nationally, uh, regionally, or even at, at the local level uh, so that um, you know, the sort of forces of protectionism and, and competition and, and this idea that, oh, well, it should only be democracies and, you know, against the, the rest of the world. Uh, I, I think we, we have to be very careful uh, with that kind of approach because ultimately uh, we're all going to suffer a, as a result of it. And, and, and I share Mr. Ota's concerns uh, about, you know, this sort of, uh, uh, you know, tripolar competition, if you want, and, and the danger of fragmentation and, and obviously then countries uh, trying to grab one pole or another because they have no choice, right? This is what the polls would ask them. You're either with China, you're either with the EU, or you're with the US. And then uh, that, that's really the, the thing that we need to, uh, to avoid. Thank you. Um, Scott, maybe I can just add just one observation from a perspective of, um, you know, understanding the, the question also to be about building awareness, both in Japan, of Canada, and, and vice versa, in terms of of, of middle powers and, and but but also in terms of the perhaps the scope for more um i guess demonstration of the of the value of these partnerships that provide opportunities as as both um uh, mr ota and professor leblanc have noted you know providing alternatives and options to having to be forced to to choose potentially and i and i think when you're building up um better awareness of the of this of the the kind of um opportunities that present itself um from countries that may not be immediately um you know top of mind when it comes to us you know uh, so much of our exports go directly to the united states um you know J japan is very integrated into you know the asian um uh, markets and so on but when you when we're thinking about how to build up awareness of the opportunities bilaterally um you know i'll i'll just come back to to the um uh, perhaps like the opportunity that's presented by some of the supply chain constraints that have emerged to to actually move forward on on some of the areas where you know Canada does have the capabilities and the um, opportunity to to supply a number of the of the uh, products and and areas where Japan has has indicated a desire to to kind of have a, a bit of a, a, a broader or one can say resilient supply chain or more options in the sense of of, of a number of the agricultural products um, that Canada does supply to Japan, but that could be expanded. So, you know, canola, um, 
wheat, seafood, and so forth. Critical minerals, minerals we've talked a little bit about, both in terms of technology, but also in terms of, of clean technology. And again, you know, while in some areas we still need to to build up those sites that I think you know those those are there in energy of, of course and, and we've touched on a, a bit of the investment that can that Japan has made in Canada in, ter in terms of building up those energy linkages and supplies so I, I use those as examples of areas where um I, I think you know when the when the opportunities start to and the the links and 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 ties start to grow even more then then also so too does the awareness of the of the of the merits of of that of that bilateral relationship and the strengthening of it and the last thing I just wanted to touch on because I, it's something that I was I was watching and glad to see that we were able to join is is that in 2025 Japan will be hosting in Osaka um, you know an expo in terms of designing future society for our lives and and I just I think that's going to be a really interesting um, opportunity and signal of our you know commitment in the Indo Pacific but also commitment to the bilateral relationship and I. You know, I see some of the themes that Japan is hoping to draw out from that expo, um, in, in, including, um, you know, the, some uh, where I think there will be opportunity again to show the the, the shared. Um, you know, I'm not being trying to be too. Everything is 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 uh, is perfect. But what I mean is, is is another good venue for um, uh, building towards the the greater display of of the bilateral um, partnership and the benefits that can bring to both of our our countries. So um, didn't want to forget to sort of highlight that upcoming event on the uh, on the world calendar. Thanks. Yeah, that's an important event to bring up. Thank you. I want. I think that. With the time remaining, I can take my prerogative here as chair and ask a few questions myself. And so I wanted to ask the first question to Otosan because I, I found your, your presentation to be very, very, very rich in details. And I liked the one of the graphics that I noticed was the supply chain of the semiconductor industry. And I noticed that the largest number was actually that supply chain between China and Taiwan. And, you know, there's been all this stuff in the news and the media recently about, you know, possible war and so forth. But that number is, I think, an important thing as well, as well as the large number of Taiwanese who live in China, as well as the very large amount of Taiwanese investment in China. So I wonder if perhaps the semiconductor supply chain, might that not be a stabilizer there? Well, the U.S. and China is fighting over the very advanced technology of semiconductor. But uh, looking at the, the volume zone of semiconductors, uh, you cannot cut the supply chain. Uh, well, TSMC, as I, as I said, uh, has a, a top-notch technology in the fabrication, mm -hmm. but well, they're not making out of this. I mean, the, the big business of them, for them is, is uh, the middle, uh, range of the, the technology. So in this uh, um, um, market, and the US and China are uh, uh, dependent on each other. Mm -hmm. So we cannot uh, decouple the, the business here. So that, so we have to look at. So um, of course, China, uh, the, the US uh, cut the, 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 the tie between Taiwan and China. But technology flows in, in the middle range, even though there, must, there may be a decoupling of the super high tech mm -hmm. or uh, the regular high tech. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you have to step you know, together. The other thing I wanted to say about the CPTPP and the DEPA uh, is uh, there's an argument that China want to join the CPTPP and uh, they raise their hand uh, mm -hmm. to get uh, into the, the DEPA as well. And there's an argument in the West side that they say China shouldn't be there. I mean, they are blocking mm -hmm. the China come in. But I don't think this is the right uh, choice. Uh, I would say let them in to CPTPP or DEPA. So, well, blocking somebody want the, the nation who want to come in, mm -hmm. blocking and protecting the, the, the field they are trying to build itself is a protectionism. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, there's a place where you can openly discuss about the, discuss the free trade and the future shape of the future rule of uh, the digital economy. 
So at least, you know, we can talk about it on the same uh, base. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that is a message from Singapore and New Zealand mm -hmm. uh, to the, the great nations, US and EU. But as I said before, uh, US, China, EU has to, they have to fight against each other. Uh, but the, the US, I mean, Canada or Japan or probably uh, some other middle powers, mm -hmm. uh, they can have different strategy. And we have to take the message from small nations, ASEAN, Singapore, New Zealand. So the US, China catch the message differently, mm -hmm. but there must be different way uh, to go for Japan and uh, the Canada. Well, uh, CPTPP, deeper, I think they have, it, it should be open to everybody. What about Taiwan? Taiwan too, <laughs> even <laughs> though, even though China doesn't, they don't, they, they don't, doesn't uh, admit that Taiwan is an independent nation, mm -hmm. but uh, they as a mem Taiwan is a member of the WTO. Mm -hmm. It is possible. But at the same time, Taiwan, uh, China, well, let them in to TPP. So I wanted to ask one final question. I know we're running out of time, but everybody's been bringing up Asian and Canada has a lot of immigrants from those countries like Philippines and Vietnam. So how can we take advantage of that immigration uh, to increase Canada's ties with the region? I think that's probably for Lynn. Well, well, thanks for the for the question, Scott. And and you're 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 quite right. Um, and and you know certainly that was one of the um, really most sort of uh, I, I guess uh, parts of aspects of the job of being abroad in Hong Kong and Singapore that I enjoyed so much was was being able to you know talk about well first see firsthand the intersection of, of some um, Canadians with um, sort of a um, family background or links or even first generation immigrants coming from Southeast Asia or of course many from Hong Kong and then drawing those links and ties between Canada and and uh, and, and Asia and so using not only the um, expertise in terms of language abilities but also awareness of the whether it be cultural or business practices in the region to to really help um, draw those linkages because at the end of the day you know the government can put into place trade agreements um, and as to professor leblanc's point you know <laughs> business has to has to have the interest there to to follow um it, it, we you can't um you know, force uh, force exporters to go where they don't want to go. And I, I think um, what we benefit from as a, as a country that welcomes um, new immigrants uh, is, is we benefit from those links and ties that they can, they can um, help, help draw um, and, and close those, those gaps or, or open opportunities to put it in a, in a more positive way. Um, so I, I think in terms of awareness building, there's also a recognition um, in terms of our, um, of our small and medium enterprises about providing the the support to them to be out and and to diversify in terms of markets. I know we're running out of time, so I'll just say that yes, I mean it's it's a it's a real trump card I think for Canada to have such a, a diverse population, and and we're seeing firsthand the benefits when it comes to from a trade perspective um, in terms of the uh, exporters that are led by um, those um, those members of our our population. Thanks. Good. I think that's a good place to end it. Our, our webinar. It's been a really great webinar. So I want to thank uh, everybody for being here. Uh, uh, Mr. Oda, Ms. McDonald, Professor LeBlond, and I, think I want to thank the Japanese Embassy and SIPS and the Paul Tidia Chair for, for bringing this together. Um, so just say thank you, everybody. And we do have to close now, but it's, it's been a, a good discussion. And I look forward to more discussions uh, with uh, Japanese colleagues and SIPS colleagues. And so thank you very much. Arigato gozaimashita. Merci beaucoup. Et chi